a thought is just like an automatic set of words or image that pops up into your head, fairly surface level, but it's often born out of a belief, which is much deeper. And a belief is essentially a thought that you've said to yourself over and over again so many times that you've started to believe it and it's become a story or a narrative that you live into. If we're all going to be control freaks, I want you to be able to control something that is directly within in your hands. And that is how you respond to those stories. You can choose to give those stories energy and to live them out, or you can choose to acknowledge that that story is there, but to do something different in response to it. You can act in a way that goes against the story for the betterment of your life. What is and what is not true? Those who know themselves being better every single day. Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Think Grow podcast, where personal development meets real life. I'm your host, Ruben Chavez, and I explore a variety of topics with thought leaders, psychologists, researchers, entrepreneurs, artists all sorts of interesting people with the goal to bring you different perspectives you can use to enrich your mind and improve your life in whatever way you see fit. Today, I'm speaking with Rebecca Ray. Rebecca is a clinical psychologist. Uh, she's also an author and a speaker. And actually, we've been friends for several years on Instagram, so it was really nice to sit down and just speak with her um, candidly here about some of the the issues that she sees as a psychologist and um, and some of the the messages that she writes about on her on her instagram and and in her books um, she 's the author of three books actually her most recent published book is the Universe Listens to Brave and uh, her upcoming book is is called the Art of self kindness and that 's going to be released in august this august two thousand and nineteen but a lot of Rebecca's message uh, and a lot of her work centers around the idea of living bravely and and of courage and and so she she th this theme pops up a lot in her work in different ways. Um, in our conversation, I I ask her what are some of the the most common issues that she sees as a psychologist both in her practice and and online. We also talk about the roots of my perfectionism and kind of where that might have originated from. We touch on my childhood a little bit and, you know, she doesn't psychoanalyze me fully, but we definitely get into to some of that and it was really interesting and, um, and actually quite enlightening. I, I really liked talking with her. She actually gave me a very useful mindset shift, if you will, when it comes to dealing with limiting beliefs at, at a certain point in our conversation. And that was actually one of my favorite parts of our conversation. It was one of my main takeaways, I'll say. There, there were many parts that were, that were useful, but that was one of my personal main takeaways was when we start talking about beliefs and um, her perspective on that. We also talk about the concept of acceptance and what that means in the context of dealing with challenges. It's, it's not exactly what you might think, and Rebecca's take on it is, I think, very practical, and um, a lot of you will find, find it very useful. So I hope you love this conversation as much as I did. I, I really felt like I could have talked to, to Rebecca for a long time, much longer than I did here. It was a very easy conversation and she is an extremely intelligent woman with a lot of valuable insights and, and a lot of wisdom, not just from, from living, but from um, her time as a psychologist and her experience working with people. So hope you like this conversation. Let me know what you think. Here is Rebecca Ray. I'd like to know a little bit about, a little bit more about your background and a little bit um, more about how you, you know, became a, a psychologist and, and how you got on this, 
this path of, of talking about, um, you know, courage and, and of the, the principles and the ideas that you talk about? It's kind of a big question. It's two questions in one because how I became a psychologist is not how I came to be here, if that makes sense. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> how I came to be a psychologist. <laughs> Answer it however you see fit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll fill in the blanks. Um, how I came to be a psychologist was one day I was, I think we had a, an information night at school when I was 15 and it was kind of a careers night and I just thought to myself, wouldn't it be amazing if you could find out all the answers of why humans do what they do? And so at 15, I decided I was going to be a psychologist and I left school and went straight to uni and studied psychology. My first little bump along the road was I started learning to fly <laughs> of all things. And, um, while I was learning to fly and doing all my flying training, I then became convinced that I wanted to be a pilot for a major airline in Australia. And I did a whole heap of training and spent a whole heap of money on flying training. And then I discovered that actually flying violates a whole series of my non-negotiables as a human being. So what I discovered was despite the fact that I loved the sensation of flying and I was very competent at it, so I passed all my tests and all that kind of stuff, it actually didn't come naturally to me at all. So it was highly anxiety provoking. I'm not a mathematical person. I'm not a visuospatial person. I'm an give me some words and I'll put them together type of person. Sit me at a desk um, in an isolated way for a long period of time and you'll have a happy back, you know. And flying is very visual spatial, I, I imagine. So th that that was one of your non-negotiables? Yeah, that was one of my non-negotiables. And it's very mathematical and that's not me at all. And it's also very non-routine. So that means that approaching the airport every day, I would feel like I was going to vomit, even though it was just a training flight, because things are different every day. You don't know how many aircraft will be out flying. You don't know what the weather's going to be like. You don't know what air traffic control is going to ask you to do. And so my anxiety was at an all-time high and it got to the point where I had to really acknowledge that despite the fact that I'd spent all this money, at some point I needed to stop because it was no longer working. And so I had to process a whole series of feelings of failure around that and embarrassment and shame that I hadn't continued with a goal to where I wanted, where I told everyone I was going to get to. And so I did that and I went back to psychology and I finished my training in psychology. And then I discovered that my initial goal of figuring out exactly why humans do what they do was not answered by studying psychology. <laughs> <laughs> and that through psychology, there is so much we still don't know about humans. So, But you found out a little bit more, hopefully. I did. I found it. Yeah. Just, yeah. Eight years of study more, but still not perfect answers. And I studied and finished finish my study and um, then I did a whole heap of psychology practice and I ended up practicing in such a way that I burnt myself out. And so, again, this experience of failure, you know, I, I spent five years working in private practice seeing on average 40 people a week, um, which I would never advise my supervisees to do today, you know. I don't know how I did it and I just had difficulty saying no to doctors who wanted to refer their patients and I did, in a nutshell, if I'm very succinct, I did too much of it and what that meant was I could no longer do it in a way that my spirit wasn't being damaged. I could no longer do it in a way that I wasn't taking the negative energy from the sessions home with me. And that meant that I had nothing left. And so I finally admitted that, which was hard, Ruben. <laughs> I'm not good at admitting when, when things aren't going well or when I'm the source of the problem. And I was the source. It was my choice to do it like that. But what that meant was I needed to stop and stopping was a problem as well because part of my values is to contribute to the world to make a difference I live for that that that's what makes me operate the way I do it's what makes me feel like I have meaning in the world but then I got to this point of how do I contribute if I can no longer do private practice if I can no longer see clients and 
that's when I entered the digital world and decided that I was going to put myself out there in some kind of way that I could impact many more people than what I could do seeing people on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, it's a great way to scale your your efforts as a psychologist or anything really is the, yeah getting into the the digital world and, and, and so you've you've taken what you've learned as a, a psychologist and in your practice and applied it to to pro- different programs and you've written a, a book a couple, a couple books I, I believe um, and and help people in that way how, how has how has that been going for you and and, and and also, is it a different type of person who seeks digital courses? Like this is my this is my question actually. Is it a different ki- kind of person who seeks digital um, digital help <laughs> online, let's say, than goes into a, a private practice and, and sees a, an actual psychologist? I don't know that it's a digi- a different type of person. I just think that it's a different modality that's a makes it makes this kind of work accessible. So we might be talking about maybe not a different type of person, but a person that has different resources available to them. So someone who seeks out self-help stuff online might do so just because that's where we all are most of the time and therefore that's what's in their face and that's what becomes natural to them, kind of like their, their home environment but they might also not have the money to go to a doctor to get a referral to see a psychologist. It's a very expensive process to undertake therapy face-to-face. And one of the things I wanted to do with putting my work out into the world was also not do it in such a way that I was talking in clinical language that shamed people. So the way I put my work out into the world is by using my own language, my own spin on how we all suffer to make people feel accepted and seen. So it's not necessarily that I'm doing here's 10 signs that might make you, uh, that might, I guess, increase your awareness of the fact that you're suffering from depression. You'll never see that from me. But what you will see is, you know, hey, we all suffer because suffering is a part of the human condition and these are the things that I know about how we can face that suffering without getting paralyzed and if you do get paralyzed then these are the things we can do in response to that so I don't necessarily think it's a different person I think the person is probably always interested in their own personal growth and and being able to live deeply and richly as a human being I think it's a resource issue yeah I would would agree with you that you are the way you present the ideas, it, it is very non-technical, and, and I appreciate that. And I think your audience does too, obviously. But it's it's well, there's a, there's a there's a poetic aspect to your writing. I would say it's you write very beautifully and and in a in a very um, what kind of poetic way. What's one of the the issues that you see pop up most often in in the people that you're interacting with online, or the people that that are kind of attracted to your to your message? Uh, it's two things, Ruben. It's not one. So um, the first is self-worth um, and this sense of feeling not enough um, and an overall, an overarching sense of feeling unworthy. And the second is fear. Fear of well, everything, fear of getting outside your comfort zone, fear of being rejected, fear of embarrassing yourself. Those are the two things that I, in my experience, and certainly with my audience, stops them from living the life that they're out to create. Self-worth and and fear. Those are the two main issues that you see most often in, in the people that you're you're working with. How do those manifest Generally, is there is there one particular way that like let's take let's take um, the self worth issue for example because I think you're right this is kind of at the bottom of like if you keep asking the like with with many of our limiting beliefs I think if you keep asking the question well why this why do you believe that like at the bottom of it is is something relating to self worth or like I'm unlovable or something like that I, I don't know if you would agree with that but. That's kind of my sense. Absolutely. What are some of the ways that, that that kind of manifests or expresses itself in in people that you've seen? It expresses itself across all domains of our living. So it will express itself in relationships. People might push 
people away or they might sabotage their relationships in some way or they might stay out of relationships altogether. Um, It expresses in work. So people might often not work towards promotion because they feel they've already answered the question based on their unworthiness or their sense of unworthiness that I won't get it. I'm not good enough. Um, I'll, I'll always be overlooked um, or I won't quit my nine to nine to five job and go out and do the thing I really desperately want to do because I'm too late. Other people are doing it. This comparative kind of idea that in some way I am not enough. And then it expresses in terms of our relationship with ourselves, And this is the thing that is the foundation for how we operate in the world the most. If your relationship with yourself is based on a sense of unworthiness, then you'll constantly come at yourself from a critical point of view where you focus on your flaws, where you focus on all the imperfections that show up that that confirm the hypothesis that you're not enough. And if you focus on that and that is your answer to everything, then that is a veil that comes comes between you and life, stopping you from stepping into life in a way that will allow you to see possibilities, opportunities, the way you're loved, the way you're valued. Um, And instead, what you'll see is um, mistakes, uh, doom to come, and um, how people are rejecting you because we can make up all sorts of information. Human beings are amazing like this. Our minds will make up all sorts of information to complete a problem we've decided exists. Mm, Yes. And then when we have decided that, like you said, there's a particular underlying belief that we have, then confirmation bias kind of takes over and we're constantly interpreting any new evidence as confirmation, validation of that that limiting belief, which is kind of a really a vicious circle there. What are what are some of the the approaches? And I know this is kind of a big question, so we can we can kind of you can answer this however you see fit, and and, and we can break this down um, as we go along. But uh, what are some of the ways that that you approach um, uh, something like that when you when you are and maybe this is a more appropriate question for your private practice. You know, when you're working with someone, when you used to work with people, and and they obviously had issues of, of self-worth and that was their kind of set of limiting beliefs, let's say. What are some approaches that break that down and break that cycle? One of the things that I found was as an intern, I was really scared to go deep because I was frightened that I wouldn't be able to manage what came up in the person. And so I would stay surface level and do things like, oh, why don't you just write a list of your strengths? Now, I don't know about you, Ruben, but if you've ever done something like that, you probably, you might feel good for five minutes, but it's not a treatment as such. It doesn't transform things. And especially if you're looking at it through the lens of like, I'm not good enough, that's going to be a very uh, skewed list probably. Yes, absolutely. And if you can even come up with that list in the first place, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, you can go and talk to others about how they see your strengths, but you won't believe them anyway if you're coming at them from a position of unworthiness. And so instead, what I would do is come back to the place of where did this start? So there would be kind of a, think of a timeline, some timeline work where we go back into the history of the client and their earliest memories of when they felt not good enough or when they felt rejected or whatever the defining event was that started these feelings and then look at how that played out in their life. And it's about reestablishing their relationship with their inner child. So, if you, we're very harsh, you know, if you, if you are perfectionistic and if you are, are kind of like that personality that likes to do all the things right, then you tend to, tend to look back with hindsight and use that hindsight as a punishment on your younger self. And so what I would do is work with clients on how to go back to your younger self, your inner child at the be- very beginning, and even just yourself in your 20s or yourself in your 30s. I've, I've just turned 40, so I can look back in a whole other decade now. And if you do that with hindsight as a punishment, it's just another way that you tear down that relationship with yourself. So instead, I would work with people on how to reparent your inner child so that you could start to be more gentle on yourself and therefore rebuild the foundations of your relationship with yourself. 
This is really interesting because I would say I probably fall into that camp of perfectionistic people. And it's increased for some reason in recent years. But I, I want to understand what you're saying here. I want to make sure that I, I get it. So it, it, it's it's typically as a result of, of a past event or, or set of events in your childhood that that you're kind of looking back on with a with a, um, a distorted lens. Yeah, but that set of events can be heavily influenced by society. So it's not I'm not about to lapse into it's always the parents' fault, you know, like you and I have grown up in Western culture and our Western culture is heavily influ- influenced towards making us feel not enough so that we buy stuff. And so I'm not saying that you look back and go, oh, it's my mum's fault. You know, she made me not feel this way. In some cases, sure, it might have been, might have had a parental influence or a caregiver influence. But we also need to look at the society we're growing up in. We're very soon in the piece. We start to feel compared against our peers. That happens at school in our education system. Um, and then we start to be be compared against what messages we see in the media. And very early on, we start to learn that we will never measure up unless we're Kim Kardashian. And if we're not, then we have a whole series of things that we need to do in order to try to reach that standard. So it's not always an experience. It can be messages that we've absorbed. But, yes, going back to that inner, um, that inner child and looking at her fears and what she wasn't kept safe from. Mm, that's interesting. I'm just kind of, kind of trying to think about my experience. And I've talked about this with my wife a little bit about what led to my perfectionistic tendencies. And I mean, one of the things that we came up with, and, and I'd like to hear your take on this, is when I was when I was growing up, I was always like the good kid. I was my brother was more rebellious, and I was always like very well behaved, and I got very, uh, I got rewarded for that a lot, and I got a lot of verbal um, validation, a lot of love, really, by by being the good kid. I was always I was um and I was um, commended for being like very tidy, um, commended for being very um you know, organized, very polite, and, and, and also very well behaved, I would say as an overarching thing. So, so, and part of that led to like me loving words of affirmation, if we're talking about like the five love languages, right? So that that's really big for me now as an adult, like I love words of affirmation. Um, that's how I kind of interpret love. But I, I'm, I'm wondering if there's anything there that, that would have kind of led to a more perfectionistic attitude as an adult. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Absolutely. If that's what you've been re- re- rewarded for, then that's what will maintain the behavior. The thing is, though, you find different ways of confirming that you're being rewarded for it in adulthood because obviously your parents aren't re- picking up the phone every day and saying, hey, Ruben, you've been a very good boy today and we're right. very proud of you. You know, so that's not happening every day now as an adult. Now it's like I'm sitting and I, I'm perfecting the font of a post that, that I'm creating for Instagram for three hours unnecessarily, you know what I mean? Because it has to be just right. And sometimes I'll get so frustrated with myself. I'm like, why Why am I doing this? It's almost, I don't talk about this a lot actually, but I'm... <laughs> And I don't expect you to fully psychoanalyze me here, but I, I just think it's interesting that you mentioned it, so I, I I brought it up. But yeah, it's sometimes it's very fr- it's often very frustrating for me when I'm I catch myself in the middle of it. I'm like, this is unnecessary, and I'm definitely like being perfectionistic and kind of a like almost just procrastinating doing other things because I'm I'm focusing on this fairly trivial aspect of of a project. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't show up as my parents confirming. It's more me just like being perfectionistic now and wanting to get validation from strangers even on the internet, things like that. 
That's right. And so the reward is not your parents saying, Ruben, you've been a good boy. The reward is the number of likes that you get from that post and then what you and the number of comments and the type of engagement. What you then tie that validation to is that three hours of perfecting that post was worth it. If I hadn't have spent that three hours, I wouldn't have gotten, you know, thousands and thousands of likes. What that's born in, perfectionism, procrastination, all forms of self-sabotage are born uh, is born out of fear. And it's the fear that if I let go, if I stop controlling, then I run the risk of being rejected. I run the risk of being seen to be unworthy. I run the risk that I will finally find out that I'm a fraud or I'm an imposter. It's all fear. And so we have all these kind of little mechanisms. Your perfection of your posts is a mechanism to keep that sense of control, which is completely false, right? We can't control anything. Yeah. The Instagram algorithm could change in 24 hours. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't get those likes. Um, but we, we give ourselves this false illusion that we can control to not have to sit in the uncertainty that, you know, life is just as un uncertain as what it is. And, in fact, we have to bring our own sense of worthiness within us. So that's how they're connected because you mentioned self-worth and fear are two of the bigger issues that, that you see. Yeah. And so that's how kind of how they're connected is that the, the, the self-worth stems from, from fear. Exactly. So that, well, the sense of unworthiness plays out as fear. Mm. So if we look at unworthiness as this, that's the bedrock. And then the fear is the expression of the sense of unworthiness. It's, it's, it's the emotional feeling and all the mechanisms that we do to, to, to control that sense of fear or to get rid of that sense of fear is based on the fact that we're so fearful that we won't belong. We're so fearful that we'll be rejected and therefore that will confirm that we are actually unworthy. Does that make sense? I, I, I'm, I'm going to try to unpack this with you a little bit because sure. I, I do, I want to clarify it a, a little bit. You're saying that basically fear is the expression of, is the ultimate expression of the uh, lack of worthiness. Yes, that's right. It's what we feel. We don't, I guess, unworthiness is not really a feeling. It's not really an emotion, but the emotion that accompanies it is fear. It's also shame. It's also guilt. Um, but when it comes to our lives being contracted and not being as big as what they could potentially be, or not no, big is not the right word, not reaching their potential is what I want to say, um, then that's based in fear. I mean, because there's, there's a healthy form of this, right? Like we want to, we want to do things well and we want to, you know, achieve our goals, whatever they may be. And so when does it go too far? When does it become un unhealthy? Because you don't want to just say, oh, well, you know, like, I, I don't care about anything. So when does it become unhealthy? It becomes unhealthy, I think, when it completely paralyzes us because our power lies in action. And if your fear gets to the point where it stops you from taking any action because you've decided that you'll fail and therefore you won't even try, that's when it becomes unhealthy. If it, if, and that, that includes all areas of life, not just um, career. What happens if you get to the point where you'll never date again because your last relationship ended badly and you decide that that means that you're broken or there's something about you that's unworthy and therefore you're too scared to even try again? So you step out of life. Brene Brown would say you step out of the arena and sit back on the sidelines I would say that's when this expression of fear becomes um, paralyzing to the point where it's unhealthy. It's stopping you from living. And so what do we do about this? Like how, how, how can we deal with, with these set of issues? Because I'm hearing what you're saying and I think this is, this is a pervasive set of issues and, and I relate a lot to, to what you're saying in, in certain aspects of my life. So I'm just wondering like, you said that as an intern, you were afraid to go deeper and you mentioned a little bit about how you might go deeper with someone. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, what you, what that looks like and, and if people want to kind of go the self-help route at, at home, um, as opposed to seeing a therapist, 
how would they go about kind of exploring their their past and maybe looking at what, you know what you call the inner child and things like that? I think one of the most effective ways is through writing. So writing is a way that we can, yeah, writing is, and you do a lot of this, and you might have noticed through your practice of writing that you discover things that are born out of your unconscious that you otherwise would never have known were there. Writing, what what writing does is it slows down our thoughts because your hand can only move so fast, you can only type so fast. Um, I actually... I'm a big proponent for handwriting because it is that much slower than typing again. So what it allows your unconscious to do is actually bring up information that you didn't know was there in the first place. And that allows you to discover, particularly if you're writing on this topic, number one, what is what is the source of these beliefs? Because we're so automatic as human beings, we often don't even know what we're thinking let alone what the belief is behind it. And so, hold on, let me just explain that a bit. A thought is just like an automatic set of words or image that pops up into your head, fairly surface level, but it's often born out of a belief, which is much deeper. And a belief is essentially a thought that you've said to yourself over and over again so many times that you've started to believe it and it's become a story or a narrative that you live into. And that could be a story about you, or it could be a story about others, people in general, or it could be a story about the world or about the particular situation or circumstance that you're in. Um, For example, um, you've got a story that you live into about how you're perfectionistic and you have to do these types of things or you do these types of behaviours in these situations. Some stories are based in fact, other stories are just what we start to believe. So somebody might have a story that they're unlovable because their last three relationships have ended badly. The One of the things that happens when we start to write about those these things is we start to see what beliefs are there And then we have a choice as to what we do with them. When we're human, (laughs) let me be gentle because I suffer here too. So when we're human, we are simply generally without awareness, we are just responsive to what our thoughts and feelings and body sensations um, occur for us in the present moment. We have no choice over those things unless we bring a greater awareness to them. And then our choice lies in how we respond to those things, not necessarily what things are there in the first place. So I don't want our listeners to get all excited about potentially changing their beliefs or changing their stories because that's a really difficult thing to do. What's far more in your grasp if we're all going to be control freaks? So I'm raising my hand as a control freak as well. If we're all going to be control freaks, I want you to be able to control something that is directly within in your hands. And that is how you respond to those stories. You can choose to give those stories energy and to live them out, or you can choose to acknowledge that that story is there, but to do something different in response to it. So if you've got a story that you're unlovable because your last three relationships have ended badly, you might then say, oh, I noticed that story coming up. I noticed that I feel a bit of fear in my chest, a bit of anxiety in my gut, but I'm still going to reopen my profile on Bumble. You can act in a way that goes against the story for the betterment of your life. I suspect that this is connected to something else I wanted to talk to you about which is this idea of acceptance that you write about. And, and I think what you're saying is, I, I really like that actually. I, I really like what you just said. It, it's not necessarily that we need to change the belief, but that we need to acknowledge the, the belief, identify the belief, and then change how you respond to, to when that belief comes up or when the scenario comes up that kind of triggers that thought pattern. And that's really useful. That's what I, I, I think I've, I've thought about that in various ways, but you said it very succinctly and very clearly. So I appreciate that. I want to come back to this issue of, of acceptance because it connects really well. But I, I want to say first that I love the, the act of writing. And I think I agree with you. It's super powerful in clarifying your thoughts because it forces you to clarify your thoughts. Actually, when you write, you, you have to actually 
come up with a coherent thought to put on the paper. I mean, there's another version of that, which is just like morning pages and just you kind of throw up all over the page. And that's cool too. I think that's really useful. But for me, for, and it's something that I don't practice enough actually. And, and I think it would benefit me. But something that has benefited me a lot is when something's bothering me. And I've written about this on my blog and on my Instagram. But when something's bothering me and, or when I feel a, a negative emotion, it's it's really useful for me to to write out exactly what it is that's bothering me. Like just put like bullet points on paper. Like oh, this is bothering me because of this. Like this person said that, or I'm not at the place I want to be here, or whatever it is. Like however petty it sounds, and and however silly it is, I just write it down and I and, like in bullet point format. And then I have like a list of four or five things right that that are that are bothering me, and I find that so therapeutic. And, and often I find that A, the problems are very silly and they're, they're, they're smaller than I, than I thought they would, than I thought they were. And B, that they're actually pretty manageable, like that they're, they're actually solvable problems. And those are things that are not obvious if you don't write them down, you know, because if you hold everything in your head, it's almost like it becomes bigger than it actually is and you can turn it into this monster whereas if you contain it on paper then it's something that you can actually tackle yeah exactly yeah i appreciate you talking about that what writing also does is it takes the emotion out of it so what you're speaking to is the logical um the logic and the rationality that comes back into just words on a page so when we write particularly if you're right-handed it activates the left prefrontal cortex in the brain and that the left side of our brain is responsible for all the smart stuff that our brains do. It's responsible for logic, planning, um, rationality, decision-making. Um, and it's also the filter in our brain, you know, so it's, it's the part of our brain that draws our behavior in so that it's socially acceptable. And when we write, that part of the brain lights up. So it's the part of the brain that goes, well, the problem is just that, this is not working in this part of my life. And like you say, it comes, it becomes this big monster in our heads. And then we, when we write it down, it becomes smaller than us. And I think sometimes when we let our minds run away, I don't know whether you're like this. I certainly am as an overanalyzer from way back. Um, when you let something have free reign in your head, it certainly has this sense of being bigger than you, which makes you feel out of control. It makes you feel overwhelmed and it stops you from feeling like there's anything that you can do to impact the situation. And when you write it down, it is literally just letters on a page. It's smaller than you. And because you've just activated the left part of your brain, then all of a sudden your capacity to find solutions becomes reactivated. I want to take a brief moment to talk about one of our sponsors for this show, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 25,000 classes in pretty much any field you can think of. Writing, photography, uh, cooking, even social media marketing, just to name a few. One of the many reasons that I love and promote Skillshare is because their core values of learning and growing are very much in alignment with my own and I'm sure if you're listening to this with yours too. I'll tell you about one of my favorite classes that I've ever taken with Skillshare. It was a productivity master class and it was all about creating systems in your life and business. And it was taught by this pretty well-known YouTuber and it completely changed how Vanessa and I run our business. It helped give us our time back by helping us to create systems that streamlined and organized our content creation and our editorial calendar for Think Grow Prosper. Massively, massively helpful. And here's the cool news. Right now, Skillshare is offering listeners of the Think Grow podcast two months free so you can try it out for yourself. Go to Skillshare.com slash Think Grow. You'll get unlimited access to 25 thousand classes for a full two months at no cost. So it's basically a risk-free situation here. The specific URL that you want to visit for this offer is skillshare.com slash think grow. Check it out. Join the millions of other students who are learning and growing with Skillshare. 
I've used it for a while, I love it, I think you will too. Again, that URL is skillshare.com slash thinkgrow. And now, back to the show. I don't know where I heard this phrase, but I have it in the back of my mind. I've written it so many times that who knows where it came from. But known monsters are less scary than unknown monsters. And that, to me, kind of sums up that, that idea. Yeah, I, the, that's a really interesting idea that the kind of integration of the left and the right hemispheres that you're talking about, I just learned that recently, that like the science behind why journaling works. I was reading this book by, um, actually his name's Daniel, uh, Dr. Dan Siegel, who I had on my podcast recently, and it's called The Whole Brain Child, and it was about parenting, right? And it's about kind of um, how to, it, it's, it's essentially a manual for helping your child be more emotionally intelligent. And one of the things is, is that when a traumatic experience happens with your, with your child, or, you know, when they experience something traumatic, you don't want to ignore that. You don't want to not talk about it because then they don't process it properly. And so, so you talk with them about that. You know, you say, Hey, how did you feel when that happened? And, and then they tell the story, which is the logical part of, you know, I'm sorry, when they tell the story, that's kind of the emotions, you know, but, but then they connect it all. They connect it all through the sequence of events and that's the logic part of it. And so journaling does the same thing. It, it, it connects the left and the right hemispheres. And that's kind of what Daniel Siegel refers to as, as integration. And that's super powerful. Absolutely. And that's what therapy does as well, Ruben, or, or even just talking like right now, as you reflect back to me, Beck, I want you to say this idea differently or, or am I getting this right? Am I hearing what you say? You are integrating my thoughts. So as we speak, when, when, cause this is the other thing that you can do, you don't, if you're not a fan of writing and not many people, um, sorry, Lots of people are, but there are people who would run a mile if you told them to write something. You can also get the same effect by sitting with someone who's trustworthy and supportive, someone that you feel sees you and hears you and values you in the world. And if they're a good listener like you are, then what the sense that you get as they're reflecting back is that same sense of integration. It doesn't have to happen by writing. And that's why therapy is also so effective. But it also happens by reading. If you read something that you feel explains you and you've never felt explained in that way before, that same sense of Tetris happens in your brain where the puzzle gets put together and you're like, wow, I never saw myself like that before. It's a process of integration. Yes, I love that. No, I I totally agree with you. Um, My wife has been my... (laughs) on-site therapist for a long time and has helped me out of so many so many frustrating places emotionally that I've been and helped me work it out because it's 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 kind of like there's levels you know you can do a self-help exercise and and that's cool you can do you, you can you can work it out yourself but then you and then you can talk with somebody else and maybe someone you trust and that's another level and you can kind of work out your thoughts there and then you can if that doesn't work then like therapy like that's super useful too and and i've and i've had had my share of therapy as well um and so i just these tools are very useful but you're right talking with somebody you trust because much like writing when you speak you also have to come up with something coherent to say you can't just have vague thoughts in your head floating around you have to and then when you when you speak also you kind of outsource your sanity to other people in a sense because you're like oh, is this a crazy thought and then they'll bounce back oh well actually this part of it is crazy but this part of it is actually pretty valid and then you refine your thinking and you whittle down what it is that you're actually that's actually bothering you and so that's also really useful okay so I'm having a great time this is really this is really exciting and and, and I like where this conversation is going we were I want to pick up the thread again of of acceptance and and how that kind of connects to this set of uh, issues surrounding fear and lack of self worth. So I think we were we were we were talking about when you know fear is the manifestation of of a lack of a lack of self worth in a nutshell, and then 
the idea is, look, there's a set of underlying beliefs beneath all that, limiting beliefs that, that's beneath all that. And you can try to change it, but your your philosophy is like, look, those are there. And rather than needing to change them necessarily, you can also acknowledge that they're there, uncover what they are, identify them, and kind of accept them to a degree and um, and then respond differently to them. So this 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 brings us to to the the idea of acceptance, which is a really profound idea, I think. And a lot of people don't grasp it in the way I think that it's meant to be understood. So I'd like to to help. I'd like you to help us connect the dots there. Um, what what do you mean by by acceptance and and how is that different from just kind of like apathy, let's say. I think the people struggle with the idea of acceptance because the definition of acceptance in the dictionary is different to how we might use self um, acceptance in psychology or in the self-help literature. So in the dictionary, if you accept something, then you're cool with it. You're okay with it. You, you know, you want it. It's you are condoning that thing. And yet when we talk about it from a psychological point of view, an emotional point of view, what we're talking about is that you accept your present moment experience for what it is, but that doesn't mean that you like it or that you want it or that you approve of it. It just means that you are not going to spend your energy on struggling with what it is because we can't control what we think or what we feel or what our body sensations are doing. We can only control how we respond to those things. So the process of acceptance is by consciously saving your energy, consciously conserving your energy and what you have to be able to respond to those thoughts and feelings while still accepting that this is what I'm experiencing. Now, that is just so bloody abstract that I'm going to bring it back to an example, okay? okay. <laughs> because our listeners might be sitting there going, yeah, okay, you just sound like a textbook um and that's that's not helpful <laughs> perfect yeah examples are always useful it's funny because I, I have so much trouble coming up with examples Beck. like just as a side note like when I'm writing or even when I'm speaking I can say something like you just said like kind of abstractly and it makes sense for me but I have so much trouble coming up with examples like actual real life examples which is so crazy, but I'm glad you don't. So please proceed with, um, with your example. Oh, no, I do. I, I do. I'm the same. And I think you and I might be similar in that we go for the cerebral type of explanation, but come back to struggle to make it, um, you know, translate that into language that the lay person can understand. And perhaps that's because of what we read, or perhaps it's just because we are still making sense of our own experience. And so when I come up with examples, often they're self-based because that's what I have immediate access to. So the example that I would give you is, um, so I just released a course and part, part of the promotion for that course was to go on video. Now, I loathe video, okay? It's not my friend. I don't like being on camera, this is different. So for our listeners, Ruben and I are talking on video right now, but this is different because it's not out in the public domain. So there's just something about being on camera that raises every single fiber of anxiety that lives inside me. I'm with you. Yeah. But I was so, I believed so much in this course that I wanted to put it out to my audience and I wanted to connect with them. So people connect by seeing faces. It was so important to me to be able to connect in that way that I sat with the fear and did an Instagram live and then did it again and did it again. But while I was doing it, my throat was dry. There were butterflies in my stomach. I actually shook while I held a piece of paper that I was holding. And you can see if you play back that light, I don't know, it's disappeared now, but when I played it back, you could see the fear in my eyes. Acceptance is I'm going to do what's consistent with my values as a human being and accept what shows up in the process because it's important to my heart. So in order to be able to live by our values, which is things that drive us deep down, we have to accept discomfort along the way. That's how we live bravely. You can't live bravely without discomfort. And so acceptance is being able to be okay with that discomfort that shows up in the service of doing something important. It doesn't mean you've got to accept every bit of discomfort. You know, I was cold before, so I put the heater on. I don't have to just accept being cold. 
But in order to be able to do something important, like putting something out into the world in a, in a method that I don't like, then I have to accept what would show up in the process of doing that for the greater good. Uh, sorry, sorry, can I just clarify that? That's my greater good. <laughs> I'm not saying that, that, that what I was putting out into the world is world changing. I'm just saying for my greater good, for the potential I wanted to live into, I had to accept that discomfort. Yeah, no, it's, it's something that Eckhart Tolle talks about this. And he says, when you encounter a situation that you don't like, you either, you can change it if you, if you can change it. Um, if not, then accept it or leave. Uh, all, every, anything else is madness. He says, and, and I think that because it's an internal thing, like you might not even be able to, like nothing might change. It's possible that nothing changes about your situation, but if you can accept it and then proceed like that, like then you've changed internally. And that, that does change the way you respond to things because so from the outside, it may not look any different, right? It may not look any different to anybody. But if you internally go, okay, well, this is what it is, um, and now here's how I respond to it, that's much more empowering than, than resisting what is, right? Than constantly resisting what it is that's actually happening because from that, from that um, vantage point, you, you really are disempowered, right? Because, and, and you're also not thinking – as well or as clearly as, as you could be because you're resisting, oh, this shouldn't be happening, this shouldn't be happening. And so I think that's kind of how I process what, you, what you've said. That's exactly it. What you're talking about is the fourth option, which is struggling and investing all your energy in that struggle. And if that's where your energy goes, then what you're doing is you're creating more struggle. It's like a tug of war. The harder you pull, the strong, the more tension you get. If you drop the rope, then the other person might still be there waving the rope in your face. You might still be jumping up and down trying to invite you into the game. But your choice to drop the rope means that you may not like the circumstances, but there is no struggle with the, with those circumstances, emotions, feelings, thoughts, whatever they, they are. It's your choice is to um, conserve your energy to how you respond to those things. And then, like you said, I loved what you said just before. Um, you're essentially saying when we do these things time and time again, what we essentially do is widen comfort zone. We widen what life becomes for us. So in a way, those um, beliefs do start to change because we disconfirm them so much. So I've just disconfirmed the fact that I can't do Instagram live, you know, <laughs> because uh, right. I did it a lot during that period. That So that belief is no longer there. I can do it. I don't like it and I probably never will like it, but I can do it. So that 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 belief is no longer there. And that's that's how our lives get bigger and braver. Yeah, yeah, because you basically, with any belief, you you have it because you've collected a certain amount of evidence for that belief. So you have these legs that are holding up this table, right? And so when you do the opposite, or you know, when you act in a way that is more intentional and in a way that you might not otherwise act, and you disconfirm that belief, now you're building new legs for that table because you're gathering more evidence for the new belief, right? For, for the belief that you can do Instagram live or that you can be lovable or whatever. And so that's a really important point. It's like you, you really have to take note of the new evidence that this confirms your old belief. You know what I mean? Yes, but the way we act is with an attitude of acceptance. So we're not denying our feelings while we take that action. The, and the reason I point this out is because there's this technique in psychology called acting as if. And I just don't believe in it. I, it drives me insane when people go, oh, just act as if you're not scared. That's a complete denial of your emotional experience. So what we're talking about when we're talking about acceptance is there's a full and conscious and mindful acknowledgement of this is uncomfortable and I honor myself in that. But I choose to take this action anyway because it's consistent with my values. So far, my, my key takeaway here, I, I really like the way you, you, you talk about that. Um, it's, it's, it is very intentional and it's very, it's not denying anything. It's, it's not denying your experience or your feelings even. 
it's actually the opposite. It's actually embracing them. It's it's acknowledging them even full, like more fully, right? So I think when when you resist something, you're you're actually not acknowledging the the wholeness of the experience in, in, to a degree. So acceptance is really not a denial. It's more of a it's more of an embracing of the situation, so that you can act more intentionally and 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 move forward in a way that empowers you rather than disempowers you. Just to kind of round out this this idea, what are some, I guess, methods or approaches or strategies that that we can flesh out to to help people practice acceptance? I mean, I think that just the idea of pausing and and acknowledging, identifying the emotion that you're feeling is is something useful. What else, like? is in there that that's useful like how can people start to do this because for, for for someone who's who's maybe never heard of this idea before this concept before you know and they stop listening to this podcast and they go out and they have a negative experience or something or something it triggers a limiting belief that they have what's something that they can do immediately to to help implement this this concept this abstract concept that we're talking about let's do one for feelings and one for thoughts. So okay. your one is the one for feelings and it's perfect. Just pause, take a breath because breathing, what breathing does, and I mean, you just look around Instagram and there's quotes about breathing. The reason breathing is so important is because it reverses the um, activation of the fear center in our brain. So it helps us to calm down in that moment. Take a few breaths and then identify what the feeling is just by labeling the feeling. So I'm feeling scared right now. Just by saying that helps us to detach from the feeling and helps the feeling to just be what it is rather than to be our own identity. So the feeling is scared, but we are not just the feeling. We're a whole series of other things as well. The second thing would be um, when it comes to thinking, my favorite strategy, um, and I think we might be similar in this, similar in this, in that I get a thousand thoughts at once. It's very rare that I just have one negative thought. I will have a snowball of negative thoughts. So it's really difficult for me to pinpoint one. And so instead, what I do is I just stop and call my mind for what it is. And I say, thanks, mind. Thanks for doing your job. Stop, pause, take a breath, and then acknowledge your mind for doing its job and what its job to do, what its job is, is to keep you safe. It's helping you to survive in the world. And it does that by identifying threat, whether that threat is real or imaginary. And so what I do is just stop and go, thanks, mind. Thanks for doing your job but I'm not going to spend my energy on that right now. That's really good. You're right. We are similar because I often have trouble identifying a thought. And I mean, I feel like kind of emotions are the manifestation of, of a thought you're thinking and then maybe you haven't identified, but, but I, and, and actually I have a similar thing with emotions and I don't know if you can shed any light on this, but, I think that I, I agree with you. The labeling of the feeling or, or of the emotion, I don't know if there's a distinction there, but the labeling of, of the feeling is super useful. And when I have been able to pinpoint the, the precise emotion that I'm feeling, the precise feeling that I have, uh, it, it's, that in, it, in and of itself is kind of a load off, off my chest for, for whatever reason. And you probably know the science behind that, but, I have trouble often labeling feelings, like coming up with with the the words for the feelings, which is really odd. Because um, my my wife, by the way, my wife is is like kind of the opposite in me, the the counterpart in me. She's utterly non perfectionistic. She's like I I have dubbed her style of like cooking and doing things hap hap style because it's short for haphazard. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like a funny, a funny thing that we have. And, and so, but I love it. I admire it so much because the truth is she produces results that are often better than, than me <laughs> um, in, in a lot of ways because she's not over, overthinking it. But anyway, um, she's very good at labeling her emotions and labeling her feelings. 
Um, I need like a lot of, like if she's asked me like, Hey, you know, well, if she asks me like, Hey, what are you feeling about this situation? I often am like, ah, I don't like it or it's not good. I'm frustrated. But, and that's as far as I can get like initially and she'll have to like really probe me. And, and so I don't know, I have trouble coming up with the words to label feelings. What's that about? There's a name for it, and that's alexithymia. I came across that the other day. That's so funny. And I was yeah. like, I was like, I screenshotted that because I, I wanted to show, I showed Vanessa, my wife, and she's like, oh, no, no, you don't have that. Because she always, because I'm, <laughs> I, 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 I'm also a little bit of a hypochondriac. I can be a hypochondriac if I let myself go too far. But that's so funny you <laughs> mentioned. I didn't know if that was like a made up thing on Instagram. Anyway, sorry for interrupting you. That's no. so funny. I just screenshotted that the other day. Yeah, no, it is real. But I think for me, the first thing that comes up in terms of what's that about is um, I just don't think that men, uh, maybe it will be different for our babies' generations yeah. um, because we both have sons. Um, but it's I think it's very different for men and the way they've been raised for our generation and for the generations that came before us in that you weren't socialised to use the words of emotions. You were socialised to use the words of action. And those things are like chin up, you know, big boys don't cry, that kind of thing. And so it's not necessarily in your natural lexicon to be able to draw on the words of emotions. It doesn't mean that you don't know them because you read a lot. And so you would definitely know what the words are and what they mean. It's just, it just means that they don't come up for you in the, in the moment when your right brain is taking over and you don't have access to that logical um, analytical left brain that keeps um all the ways that you process and make sense of things, when you're just in your right brain, the, that language is not there. And so your wife is probably asking you how you feel when you're feeling. <laughs> and when you're feeling is not when you have the language for it. So in when we do therapy, one of the hardest things that we work with clients on is being able to bring to mind what those feelings are and label them when they're feeling them because that's not what our brain wants to do our brain instead wants to react to the feeling which is generally to um you know do whatever the feeling is driving us to do recoil hide um run stay still you know hibernate whatever it is does that make sense yeah yeah that that makes a lot of sense and I could see how that's a big aim of therapy because, because yeah, it, it, it's not it's not always easy. And I guess you're right. I mean, I, I I probably don't have the immediate access to to the words as as my wife does, partly because of the the kind of cultural factors that that contribute to to that. So. It's, it's, it's all very, very interesting. And it's something that, that I think I need to work on. Like if someone, it's, if someone does have, what is it, alexithymia? Is that what you, is that what you said? That's right. So I, I imagine that's obviously more, more clinical, a more clinical condition than potentially what I have, what I'm experiencing. But what, what, just out of curiosity, what's the, do you know the, the treatment for that or the approach for that? Is, is that something that can be overcome? I don't know whether there's a formal treatment for it. I've always just worked with, um, and, and it's often mainly men, so I used to do a lot of work with military veterans and police, and they would really struggle being able to identify their feelings and use language around it. And so what I would do is literally give them a list of feelings and give them the definitions for those feelings and give them examples for what those feelings um felt like and so what you're essentially doing is re-educating their brains that this is what they're experiencing and this is the language for it that's a really good idea having just a list of of feelings and and kind of pointing that's a really good idea in fact vanessa said that a while back she's like oh you know you you should because <laughs> in in one of my <laughs> it's so funny it sounds funny but I, I think it's actually a useful thing in um what is it? Uh, emotional intelligence 2.0. They, they have a, a whole graph of like lists of, of emotions, and that's a really useful a useful idea. I think I'm going to try that next time. I get a, I'm going to have to carry around with my little list of <laughs> of feelings. <laughs> like, what are you feeling? I don't know. Let me consult. Make a my... little wallet card that you <laughs> right. can just pull out. <laughs> yeah, I like that a lot. 
Beck, um, this is awesome. I know that we're kind of approaching our, our time here, but I wanted to to give you an opportunity to, to kind of tell people where, like what projects you're working on and and where they can find you on social media and, and otherwise. I, by the way, I love your book. Um, I mean, the, the, the newest book, uh, your newest book, The Universe Listens to Brave, that's, I mean, it's beautiful. It's beautiful visually, but it's also beautifully written and you, you really connect these ideas, um, in very powerful ways, the, some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, but what else are you working on and where can people find you? Thank you. So you can find me across all the socials on at Dr. Rebecca Ray or one word, and I'm most active over on Instagram. And what I'm working on at the moment, my third book is about to be released. Um, it's being released next month. It's called The Art of Self-Kindness, and it really speaks to what we've been talking about in terms of that sense of unworthiness. And I've just released um, the first season of my course, Radical Courage, Transforming Fear into Freedom. And I think the second season of that will be out in September. So basically come hang out and talk about courageous and expansive living. Very cool. We're going to have the you can go to the show notes page for the the links to all of these um these courses and the books and, and your website and everything so we'll put that all in the show notes thank you so much for for being here and for for sharing these insights this you giving me a lot to think about and um hopefully act on also so thanks ruben that's a great conversation thanks for having me Hey, thanks for listening. You can find the show notes for this episode and all other episodes on my website at thinkgrowprosper.com slash podcast. That's where I put all the links and resources mentioned in each episode. It's also where I put the outlines of topics covered, which is a really good way to refer back to episodes in the future. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, I'd love to hear about it. Feel free to leave a review on iTunes with your biggest takeaway. I make it a point to read all the reviews. You can also screenshot this episode and share it to your social media along with something you learned or found interesting and tag me in your post because I'd love to see what you found interesting. Say hi and thank you for your support.